Hello, I'm Pat Leach. I'm the CEO of Decision Strategies Incorporated. We are a consulting firm located in Houston and we help our clients to think their way through complex problems. That very often involves helping them to get a good handle on probabilities and uncertainties associated with the choices that they have to make. So what we thought we'd do today is have a little bit of fun with what is sometimes called the Monty Hall problem or the game show problem, but we're going to do it with a little bit of a twist. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the game show host problem, the problem is set up this way. There are three boxes, one of which contains a valuable prize. Okay? Um, the usual way that the problem is set up, and the way it's set up with just about every other website you go to, is there's one contestant, and the contestant chooses a box. And then the game show host, who knows where the prize is, reveals that one or the other of the game show host's boxes is empty. And of course, one of them has to be empty, at least one of them has to be empty. The rule is the game show host will never reveal where the prize is. And then the question becomes, after the game show host has opened one of his boxes, the contestant has the choice of either keeping the contestant's box or trading for the remaining box that the game show host has. So we thought we'd do it with a little bit of a different twist to it by having two contestants. So we've got Diana, we've got Keppo, and they're going to come in and be contestants on the game show here. And obviously we have to change the rules a bit now because after they've chosen their boxes, I'm only going to have one box left. So rather than lifting my one remaining box, I will lift one of their two boxes. But the rule still holds, I will never reveal where the prize is, and I know where the prize is. So, Diana, go ahead and pick a box, please. I will take box number one. And Keppo, which box do you want? Mm, um, three. Okay, so that leaves me with box number two. Now, I'm not allowed to lift box number two. I'm not allowed to lift my own box. I have to lift one of theirs, and I'm not allowed to show where the prize is. And in this case, I'm afraid I'm going to have to show Diana that her box was empty. Box number one was empty. Unfortunately. So, that leaves two boxes, box number two and box number three, and Keppo is faced with the choice. Does she want to keep box number three or trade for box number two? So, how does she figure this out? Well, we set up a little matrix over here to help you think your way through the problem here. And the thing to realize is as soon as Diana and Keppo chose their boxes, I think we can all agree that there was a one-third chance that Diana had it, a one-third chance that Keppo had it, and a one-third chance that it was under the remaining box that I had. That, that's fairly easy. The concept people need to realize is the probability of my lifting Diana's box versus lifting Keppo's box depends upon which of these three states of reality we're in at that moment. Who actually has the prize? Because I'm never going to reveal where the prize is. So, given that Diana has the prize, and I would know that at the time, I would never lift Diana's box. Zero percent of the time. And so, this full one-third of the time goes into this box over here. Meaning that if Diana has the prize, I'm always going to lift Keppo's box. And conversely, if Keppo has the prize, I am always going to lift Diana's box. But there's also a probability that I have the prize. If I have the prize, then I, they each have an empty box, and I will just randomly choose one or the other. So about half the time, one half of one third being one sixth, I would lift Diana's box, and the other half of the time, I would lift Keppo's box. And we can check this by looking, if we add up the columns here, one-third plus one-sixth is one-half, excuse me, one-third plus one-sixth is one-half, and that shows that it's a fair game, in the sense that before we've ever played the game, we can work all this out, and we can see there's half, half the time I'm going to lift Diana's box, half the time I'm going to lift Keppo's box. So if you look at these six boxes here, these represent the six possibilities, the six possible combinations of these three possibilities for who has the prize, and these two possibilities of whose box I lift. 
So we're always going to land in one of these six boxes. And once I lifted Diana's box, what Keppo now knows is we're in one of these three boxes here. We're not in these over here. We can forget about those. So if we played this game many, many times, about one-third of the time we'd land in this box, we'd never be in this box, about one-sixth of the time we'd be in this box. So if we just restrict ourselves, and then of course one-third in that one, one-sixth in that one too, but in this case, I lifted Diana's box. So we're in one of these three boxes, and we will be in this box twice as often as we're in this box. And that's the box that's associated with it being in Keppo's box, box number three in this case. So, if we come back to Keppo, having learned what we just figured out, do you want to keep or do you want to trade? I am going to keep. And that ends up being a smart move because under box number three we had the prize, a thousand dollar bill. And box number two, as you can see, was empty, so we didn't rig anything here. So, not only is this sort of an interesting little twist on the game show host problem, because they say, if you, if you go to other websites, they always do it, they always frame it with one contestant. And the result when you frame it that way is that the contestant should always trade. If you frame it with two contestants, the contestant should always keep. So how you frame a problem is critically important. And we, when we work with clients, we would spend a lot of time framing up the problems correctly. Another reason that we wanted to do this problem is it's not just the game show problem. This actually, this type of thinking is how you incorporate new information whenever you're in a situation where you're trying to estimate the probabilities of things happening and you get new information which causes you to update those probabilities. And a lot of times those circumstances aren't as trivial as game shows. For instance, if you go in and have a blood test done for a disease which is a rare disease, but let's say a, a very serious disease. The probability of you getting a positive test result depends upon whether or not you have the disease, not the other way around. Whether you have the disease doesn't depend upon whether or not you have a positive test result. Just as over here, whose box was open depended upon, the probability of my raising one of the boxes or the other depended upon who had the prize, not the other way around. So it's important to set the problem up correctly. So if we go over here and we say, okay, let's imagine a disease that is fairly rare, only one in a thousand people suffers from this disease, but let's say it's fairly serious. However, there's a good blood test that you can take to see if you get a positive result or a negative result to give you an indication, a better indication, of whether or not you have the disease. And let's say that this blood test is 99% reliable in both the positive and the negative cases. Meaning, if you actually have the disease, 99% of the time you will test positive. If you actually do not have the disease, 99% of the time you will test negative. And that sounds fairly reliable. So let's take a look at the numbers, if that were the situation, you got your blood tested, and the results came back positive. What would that look like? Well, when you're talking about one in a thousand probabilities and things of that sort, the fractions get kind of ugly and the decimals get even uglier. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify the problem by saying, imagine a hundred thousand random people go in and have this blood test done, and this is an amazing day, statistics are working perfectly. So what would happen? Well, of those 100,000 people, how many of them would have the disease walking in off the street before anybody had had the blood test? Well, one in a thousand would, or 100. And of course, everybody else would not have the disease, which is 99,900. So they go in and they have the blood test done. Of the people who have the disease, 99% of them are going to get a positive result. So of these 100 people, 99 will get a positive result and one person will have a false negative. I'll make that a little heavier here. Of the 99,900 people who do not have the disease and go in to have the test done, only 1% will have a positive result. Well, 1% of 99,900 is 999. And the remaining 
98,901 would all have a negative result. So just as with the game show host problem, when you go in and get your test result and it comes back positive, all you know for sure is you're in this column here. And there are, if you add those up, 1,098 people. So out of a random 100,000 people, you would expect 1,098 to have a positive test result. But of those, only 99 would actually have the disease. And 99 over 1,098 is about 9%. So even though the test is 99% reliable, if you go in and get a positive result in this case, there's only a 9% chance that you actually have the disease. It's important to think these things through and to understand this logic when you're interpreting things like test results. And increasingly, the medical community and doctors are aware of this fact, and they'll help you think your way through this stuff. This isn't just true with blood tests. We work with a number of clients in the oil and gas industry. Very often, they will acquire seismic data and look for changes in character, which are sometimes called bright spots, which can be caused by the presence of hydrocarbons. Again, it's important to understand that it's the presence or absence of hydrocarbons that changes the probability of seeing a bright spot. Having a bright spot does not change the probability of having hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons can cause bright spots. Bright spots cannot cause hydrocarbons. So it's important to run through this logic in order to come up with an, a, an estimate, it's actually called the posterior probability, of what your new estimate is of, in that case, having hydrocarbons, in this case, having a disease, in this case, having the prize. It's important to run through this logic when you do this. And we work with our clients to do this quite frequently when we do things like value of information analyses. So, we thought that this would be an interesting and somewhat amusing way to share this information with you.